like uh, all of you, I think I, I, maybe I can relate with uh, our aspirations, our dream of uh, demolishing the walls that divide humankind from each other. And I'd like to begin by, uh, you know, presenting to you the, the symbol. <laughs> the collapse of the Berlin Wall in the formerly divided Germany is probably one of the most unforgettable images of the basic human desire to break through the barriers of enmity that separate us from each other. People who watched the event on their television screens 25 years ago now uh, did not even need the commentary to understand what was taking place. The visuals were quite enough, Germans from the East and from the West hammering on the same thick wall from both sides, all at the same time. I remember watching on television how the first crack was met uh, by a wild applause, then followed a gaping little hole, allowing the news reporters' cameras to peer through to give uh, the viewers a focused glimpse of the unspeakable excitement written on the faces of the people on the other side of the wall. Finally, one last solid blow saw the hated wall tumbling down, allowing the long-separated siblings from the East and from the West to meet and greet each other in tearful embraces. Through our television monitors from different corners of the world, and I don't know what part of the world you saw that news from, we knew somehow that we were watching a significant breakthrough in human civilization, something more significant than the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. With apologies to the people of other faiths represented here today, who may have other scriptures to draw wisdom from, allow me to draw some reflections from the writings which I have been nurtured with. I happen to be basically a biblical scholar, um, a professor of hermeneutics, namely the Judeo-Christian scriptures, or simply the Bible. I hope to share what I consider as age-old templates, sorry, age-old templates for intercultural and interfaith dialogues uh, that for me represent the deep and common human aspiration to break through the cultural and religious walls of apathy that divide us. We can shift metaphors and uh, perhaps propose uh, to picture instead of walls, chasms or gaps that keep us apart. This, by the way, is the alternative image or imagery that is used by the parable told by Jesus about the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus, the poor beggar. Well, you know the story probably, and I'd refer you to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. It's about uh, a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day and simply ignored a poor beggar by his gate. And uh, they both died, and in the afterlife there was a reversal of fortunes. The reversal of fortunes that the two men experienced in the afterlife supposedly prompted the formerly rich man to beg Abraham that the presently well-off Lazarus be sent over to comfort him in his state of torment. In reply, Abraham is supposed to have told uh, the rich man, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. The story, as it were, suggests that we will drag with us into the afterlife the chasms that we have built in this life, albeit in a reserved state. Let me then proceed to propose five templates from the Bible. Um, well, five templates. The first template is uh, the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John chapter 4. The second is again an encounter between Jesus and uh, a foreign woman, a Syro-Phoenician woman. Again, uh, some kind of an interfaith kind of dialogue. The third one is uh, the interfaith encounter between a Syrian military official named Naaman and an Israelite slave girl in the second book of Kings chapter 5. The fourth one is about Abraham and the three strangers whom he welcomed, who were angels incognito. And the last one about Babel and Pentecost. Well, let me proceed immediately to the first template, Jesus 
and the Samaritan woman. I don't know if you're familiar with this story, the encounter of Jesus with this woman from Samaria. There is an immediate uh, kind of uh, barrier that is put between them. Well, Jesus happens to be very thirsty, and she, he talks to the woman by the well and says, would you please give me a drink? And the woman puts up her defenses, and she says, you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. There is uh, some kind of uh, religious diversity here. You don't talk to me. I don't talk to you because we have nothing to do with each other. You're a man and I'm a woman as well. So there's even the gender barrier. Well, we're told uh, straight from the gospel itself that the Jews do not have or share anything in common with the Samaritans. Well, you'll have to review history why this came about. It's uh, not very different from the, the, the barrier between, say, Roman Catholicism and Protestant Christianity. Yeah. Well, um, Judaism and Samaritan faith uh, are actually very closely related to each other, but at some point there was bad blood between the two of them. The woman immediately puts up her defenses, and she says, how is it? that you, a Jew, are asking for a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. She reminds him of their disparity of faith and culture, not to mention disparity of gen gender. In reply, Jesus invites her to imagine herself in a situation in which their roles reverse. Namely, what if she's the one in need of a drink? And he, even without a bucket, would go out of his way to offer her a drink from a free-flowing well, he says. Of course, Jesus is already speaking on a different plane altogether, shifting to a figurative level of discourse. Well, the implication is that people of whatever faith, culture, or gender uh, inevitably meet each other to draw water from a common source, despite differences. Although they use different buckets, wear different clothes, speak different languages, and come at different hours of the day, they nevertheless share a common experience of thirst, a common thirst for life's meaning and purpose. The entry point of Jesus for dialogue is an invitation for the woman to see in the person before him, not someone who's different, but someone who, like any other human being, is in constant quest, not just for a drink that will satisfy the physical thirst, but more importantly, one that will quench the spiritual thirst. The woman admits that she too is familiar with this kind of thirst and is also longing for the kind of drink that will quench it. But then again, she's suddenly reminded of their differences on account of which they were expected to draw from different sources. She says, you worship in your Jerusalem temple and I worship in Mount Gerizim. But Jesus replies with an eschatological dream. He says, woman, believe me, the hour, sorry, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Thereby, Jesus prophesies a time when humankind would learn to draw again from a common spiritual source, which he calls worship in spirit and truth. Well, the expression spirit and truth sounds nebulous, no doubt, but here lies precisely what is most revolutionary about the Christian tradition begun by Jesus, which is the instinct to identify the essence of worship in spirit and truth with love. And could there be anything more universal, more transcendental than the common experience of love? So radical, radically has Christian tradition embraced this conviction that it has summed up in love all its notion of divinity. The whole law and the prophets are supposed to find their fulfillment in the love of God and the love of neighbor as oneself. One late writing in the Christian scriptures, the letter of John, could not have stated it more plainly when he said, plainly, God is love. Henceforth, we must learn to locate what is most godly, not in religious rituals, but in basic, the basic human instinct to give of oneself unconditionally, and to find in this very dynamics the fulfillment of one's humanity. This is what Jesus the Jew invited his fellow Jews to find at the very heart of Judaism that all the Torah should be summed up by the command to love God above all and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Second template, 
Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Well, this is a story about a woman of another faith again. Another faith. Asking for a favor from Jesus because her daughter is sick. Sorry, her daughter is sick and dying. And uh, she comes to Jesus with a request that he pray over the daughter so that she could get well. I mean, the daughter could get well. And what she gets is, uh, you know, a very chauvinistic reply, especially from the disciples of Jesus and later on from Jesus himself. Because to her shock, Jesus himself said, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Wow. Very insulting. But the woman does not take offense at the remark. Rather, she responds with a self-deprecating retort that both embarrasses and amazes Jesus. And now Jesus shifts to a self-correction. He realizes he was mistaken. The, because the woman says, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She was just asking for crumbs. Her readiness to swallow an apparent affront to her personal dignity for the sake of her daughter who's suffering touches Jesus to the core and moves him to grant her request. In Matthew's version of basically the same story, we are told that Jesus is supposed to have exclaimed to the woman, Oh, how great is your faith! Let it be done for you as you wish. And you know, I wonder what faith Jesus was talking about because there was precisely a disparity of faith. This woman was a Gentile. She did not profess faith in the Israelite religion. I propose, therefore, that Jesus' amazement had nothing to do with the woman's faith or her ardent hope for a cure for her daughter, but rather her love, which made her strong enough to endure rejection and insult with humility, if only to get the crumbs of grace that she begged for on her daughter's behalf. Paul himself of Tarsus had said something to this effect. In his timeless hymn on love, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if I have faith strong enough to move mountains but have no love, I gain nothing. He prefaces this whole chapter on love with an exhortation to seek what he calls a more excellent way. He had earlier spoken about spiritual gifts in chapter 12, and here he speaks about the greater gifts, and he says, the excellent gifts are three. The gifts that remain, their faith, hope, and love. But, he says, the greatest is not faith. The greatest gift is not even hope, but love. This is Paul's way of telling the reader, you may lose your faith or even your hope, but as long as you don't lose love, you're not hopeless. It's when you lose love that you lose God, because God is love. Paul goes to the rock bottom of believing and hoping, namely the loving. He has personified this love in Jesus, who responded to rejection, hatred, persecution, and all of uh, with forgiveness. The implication of the God-love equation is that godlessness is to be located not in religionlessness or even in atheism or agnosticism, but rather in lovelessness. Um, we may have missed the point ourselves, we who call ourselves Christians, and made Christianity a whole new religion among other religions. In our own failure to love, we may have ended up with a faith founded not on rock, but rather on the sand of Sophism and casuistry, the sand of dogmatism and zealotry that equates evangelization sometimes with proselytism. Even Mahatma Gandhi, who's supposed to have been drawn to the teachings of Jesus in the scriptures, is supposed to have replied to a journalist who asked if he rejected the Christian religion. He said, oh, he said, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you are, oh, so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. The original Christians were Jews who were asked to see in Christ's person the foundation of being a Jew. It was for this very reason that he did not require those of other religions to become Jews in order to profess Christ. To profess Christ for him was to profess love. The love that has become so luminously manifest on the man who only taught his disciples uh, to follow his example of loving, not just those who could love us back, but rather to extend it even to the enemy, even to one's persecutors. We're supposed to find what is most sublime in us as creatures in God's image and likeness, not in the quest for power, 
but in the capacity for total self-emptying. It is our capacity for unconditional loving that reveals the face of God. Third template, Naaman the Syrian and the slave girl. Well, this is an interesting story, an interfaith story as well, because the, the leper who needs some healing is not an Israelite either and doesn't adhere to the Israelite religion, but he goes to the prophet and seeks healing. And he feels insulted because the response of the prophet is, go and wash yourself seven times in the River Jordan. And, uh, well, the Syrian leper, uh, the, the man who is afflicted by leprosy, gets angry. And he goes away because he's a, a military commander. He said, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure my leprosy. He's, of course, not aware that the prophet is bound by the Torah not to have any physical contact with him because of his leprosy. But Naaman thereby reverts back to his chauvinism and lets his bruised ego speak out. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And he was so upset that he would have declared a war against the king of Israel had his slave girl and her fellow servants not interceded with him. And it was a little girl who said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said of you or to you was wash and be clean? And of course, the commander would listen to the girl. You see, only children can somehow pierce the bubbles uh, human, of human power play. Remember the child in the story about the emperor's new clothes? who was the only one who could verbalize the true state of the pretentious king and say, but the king is naked. Indeed, only children can see through the nakedness of human pride and quest for power, which is perhaps the most common cause of division, class segregation, and discrimination among people. No wonder Jesus said, whoever wants to be first must be last, must be last of all and servant of all. And then he reinforced his message with a gesture by taking a little child and putting it in their midst and taking it in his arm. The fourth template, Abraham and the three strangers. Well, you're familiar probably with this uh, because here, um, you know, this is just one of the many texts in the Bible about welcoming God in the strangers. The virtue of welcoming strangers finds its roots in a story about the childless couple, Abraham and the wife, Sarah. Welcoming strangers who, and thereby being rewarded with a child. This tradition is not unique in either Judaism or Christianity. It has many other parallels and versions, even in Greek and Roman mythology, where we encounter similar narratives about gods and goddesses disguised as strangers. I was a stranger and you welcomed me, says Jesus in Matthew 25. But the last judgment, the divine judge is supposed to say this. And the last template is, uh, well, from the God-induced confusion of Babel to the spirit-facilitated communication of Pentecost. It is the aspiration for power that, uh, you know, breaks us apart. We're told about people aspiring to build a tower with its top in the heavens with the objective of making a name for themselves. And this, according to the, uh, according to the story, is what divided humankind. And of course, in the New Testament of the Bible, there is some kind of a prophecy that uh, this is going to be reversed eventually. And the first experience of it is called Pentecost, the coming of the tongues of fire, when people of many different uh, nations and languages uh, started to, to speak a common language again. Well, um, let me end with this, uh, the conclusion now, sorry. The utopian dream of unity and diversity I know that the word utopian has come to assume a pejorative sense, uh, something that exists only in the realm of imagination. I beg to restore the term utopian, but uh, not just the term utopian, but imagination in its rightful place and not allow it to be equated with unreality. It was Thomas More, they say, who introduced uh, the term utopia in our vocabulary. And, uh, you know, one of the beautiful eschatological passages in the uh, book of the prophet Isaiah is a dream 
that has been engraved in the United Nations uh, headquarters in the, at the facade. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not lift a sword against another, neither shall they let, uh, learn war anymore. And then in Isaiah 11, he says, The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear, the cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put its hand on the other's den. They will not hurt or destroy any more on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Thank you.